Week 2 in Ephesians, uh, I just want to reiterate what Daniela said. Uh, the guys, we've now had two uh, installments of Man Church. It's been really good. It's blessed my heart. It informs the sermons. Guys, you speak into my life in relation to Ephesians, and it really does impact how I preach through Ephesians, which is what we're doing from now through, uh, through Holy Week. Uh, ladies, you'll be meeting again this Wednesday, and Lydia is going to be leading you in that. So I encourage you to join her. They, uh, from what I understand, they had a really good time, a really big turnout uh, two weeks ago, and they will look forward to having you here again. So today is a particularly heavy uh, and yet happy message. It's not sad, but it is, it is truly heavy. Uh, it, today is a, it is a message of, of hope. This is a message of hope for those of you who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, which is, is most of you. Most of you claim to be Christ followers. Most of you in this room, if I asked, would say, yes, I have submitted my life to Jesus, to his will, to his way, to his teachings. Uh, I, I, I attempt to align my life with the teachings of Jesus. That's most of you, not all of you, but that's most of you. And so today is a message of hope for you. And that's significant because if we're just like completely honest with one another, let our guards down, many of us today lack hope. We're not very hopeful people. So there's a need in this room, I believe, and th th that is a need for hope in order to carry on in this life. Here is the message in a nutshell. It's like one sentence. It comes out of the latter part of chapter 1 of Ephesians. We'll read it in just a moment. But here, here's a summary. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and Christ's ascension as king and as Lord, in other words, where he is now, shows the immeasurable greatness of God's power toward those who believe. Let me say that again. This is the message today. It comes right out of Ephesians 1. The resurrection of Christ from the dead and his current position as king, as Lord, they show the immeasurable greatness of God's power toward those who believe. His immeasurable power in, in my life, in your life. That means his limitless power in your life. His, his boundless power in your life. His never-ending power in your life. And, and that is specifically toward those who believe. And today that would be us, those, those of us who are in the room who claim to be Christ's followers. God's immeasurable power in the life of the believer. And the reason this is so important that we hang on every word that Paul writes here today is because most of us in this room do not feel, experience God's power in our lives. As a parent, that is particularly troubling to me because since my children have been very, very young in age, I have always told them God is powerful. And there are times, sadly, where I feel like a fraud, where I feel like a hypocrite because, again, for many of us in this room today, we say that God is powerful, but we really do not experience that firsthand in our own lives. You do not feel the immeasurable great power at work in your life today. And so today what we're looking at is um, is it not going? Is a pastor's prayer 
for his church. Today, we are looking at, at Paul's prayer. This is the latter half of, of Ephesians. And what Paul does is, he, he says, this is so important that I'm going to pin this in the letter. I'm going to write this in the letter to you, Ephesians, but I'm not just going to write it down. I, I'm praying this. This is a pastor's heart for his people, for his church. He says, this is what I'm praying. I'm writing it down because it's information. Somehow Paul believes that it's important that you, you hear this, that you're informed, that you're taught. But he also thinks it's vitally important that he, that he prays this. This isn't a light matter. This isn't a matter that, that is uh, easy uh, for you to be convinced of. He's praying that you would understand this as he explains it. It's a pastor's prayer for his people. And Paul's burden is my burden. And that is, unless something changes in your life, in your heart, in my life, in my, like we are not convinced that God is powerful. We say that he is, but we're not convinced of it. I, I'm, I believe that many young people leave the church uh, once they reach some sort of autonomous age out of this very dilemma. They've been told that God is powerful by their parents, by their Sunday school teachers, by their, by their leaders, but they have not seen any evidence of, of it in the church, in their elders' lives, or in their own lives personally. So, so Paul, he, he, uh, he prays this for you, for me, for us, for the Ephesians, as he's about to unpack the power of God, the evidence of the power of God in our lives, he prays that, that the eyes of your hearts might be enlightened. Well, what he's saying is that, that, that it's as though our, our, our hearts have spiritual eyes. And he says that they, they need to be enlightened, meaning that right now they're dulled. Maybe you feel that, that the eyes of your heart, uh, the eyes of your heart, they're, they're dull, and they need to be enlightened. There's a spiritual dullness. And there are several reasons, I'm going to briefly unpack them, there are several reasons that believers do not feel uh, God's immeasurable power toward them. There's several reasons why you don't feel it. There's several reasons that I don't feel it. But it all revolves really around this. We have dull hearts. We have eyes that don't really see. If I could paint a picture, I guess this is a, a metaphor. If I could paint a picture. If I were to say to you, man, have you ever tasted popcorn? Like, like some, some pictures here. Have you ever tasted popcorn? Like I was like, it's, it's done right. Done right, it's like hard to beat. I, I did a little like Google search this week, like in every country, what's like the tastiest food? And, and at least this little survey said that Americans, like this is what we'd say, like our go-to, like the tastiest food. I know it's, it's, not, it's, it's pretty lowbrow, but, but if I said to you, like, you know what popcorn tasted like? And then you said, yeah, I tasted it one time, and like I broke a tooth. Like, like it was, it, it, didn't, it didn't have much taste, and it was, I couldn't chew it, and it really hurt. I'm not a chicken. And, and then I, I said, no, you don't understand. You've got to uh, put the right ingredients on it. You've got to put butter on it. You got to put salt on it, and you got to really fix it right. And then you said, "Yeah, I put salt on it, and, and like it still, it broke another tooth, and it's just not for me. I don't eat uh, kernels." And, and and I said, "You know, it, it I, movie popcorn. I know it it's, it sounds cheap, but but like you let that butter soak in, and you let that that oven or warming." bin or whatever, may really bake it in, and, and it's just, it's really, it's really good. You should try it. I don't think you've ever really tasted it, and then you're like, I've got some really gross pictures of that, and uh, you're like, I've tried it, I've tried it, and, and I don't like it, and, and what I would ultimately say was, like, you've never really tasted, you've never really seen the significant taste popcorn you think you have 
But please, won't you taste and see one more time? And that's, that's what Paul is, is praying. That, that we would have spiritual eyes to really see the power. What he refers to as the immeasurable power of God working in us for all who believe. And so we as Christians, we, we need a knowledge of the Lord, enlightened eyes to really see, to truly comprehend the, the, this richness, this hope, this, this power. What we don't need is, is what John Piper calls devil knowledge. Devil knowledge, meaning, meaning that the devil, Satan himself, he knows of the power, the, the immeasurable power of God toward those who believe. Satan knows about it, but he's not impressed. He's not in awe. He never experiences it in his own life personally, but he's very aware of it. It's, it's a devil knowledge of the power, the immeasurable power. In fact, he knows it better than we do. You understand that? Satan himself knows of God's power better than we do. But it's a, it's, a, it's a dead knowledge. It's a devil knowledge. Why don't we have an enlightened view? Why, why don't we have an enlightened view specifically of God's immeasurable power in our lives? There are, there are several reasons. I'm going to give you one. Why are our eyes dim? Why are we dull toward the power of God in our lives? Why, when I, when I say to you, even right now, even in this very moment, when I say to you, God's power in your life, you understand this, is immeasurable. The, the, pa Paul says that the same power that raised Christ from the dead, that power is active and available in your life. Why is it that we just say, like, eh, yeah. Why are our hearts so so dull to the immeasurable power of God in our lives? And I believe one of the profound reasons is that we don't really understand, we don't really see the truth that apart from Christ, Satan and his minions are planning evil toward you every day. Except that the immeasurable power of God holds Satan at bay, holds back the powerful forces of the minions of Satan against you. Except that God does that with his immeasurable power toward you. Except that he does that, you are dead. You are toast. Satan wants to kill, steal, and and destroy you. But if we don't understand what we're against, if we don't understand all the evil forces that are working against us every moment of our lives as believers, then we're not that impressed. If we don't understand how sick we are, we're not impressed with the medicine that has been given us. We don't really appreciate the power of God in our lives because we don't really appreciate the power of Satan that is working against us and would be destroying our lives if it weren't for this power. You see, Satan and his army of demons, they hate you. They, they hate your family. They hate your worship, your devotion to Christ. Satan and his army of, 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 of demons, they hate your children, they hate your marriage, and they are working every moment of every day to destroy you as a believer. And it is only the immeasurable power of God that is holding them at bay. And until we understand how powerful are the forces working against us, we can't really appreciate all the power of God that is working for us. 
So we need the eyes of our hearts to be opened as Paul has prayed. Or else we just have devil knowledge. So let's look at this. I'll read it out loud. You follow along silently. Now here's what happens. Paul prays that our eyes might be open, that we might see three blessings. And I'm going to, I'm, we're going to look at all three, but only briefly. I'm only going to unpack the third blessing. But that third blessing, Paul then gives five, evident, f- f- five evidences of the, the power uh, of the third blessing. So, so he's going to give us three blessings. We're only going to unpack the third. And, he, and then there's like five subpoints on that third blessing, which is the blessing of immeasurable power. Follow along as I read out loud. You follow along silently. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And here's the prayer. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having, your, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know and here here are the three blessings that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and number three and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he, he God, he put all things under Christ's feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. I encourage you, I strongly encourage you, to, to bring your Bibles, to, to, to bring your electronic versions of your Bibles, your print versions. And, and over the next 12 weeks, as we continue to study this, I encourage you to bring it. And open it up and take notes. And, and if, you, if you haven't yet today, I encourage you to open up uh, your app, to open up the, your, your Bible, to, to, to get that in front of you right now because we're going to be referencing these verses and we just can't bounce from screen to screen as often as I would like. So open that up. Okay, here's what's going on. These blessings in Christ that we just read, they are so beyond our natural ability to comprehend that Paul precedes the description with a prayer for our enlightenment. Paul knows, like, you and I do not really, we don't really have the ability to fully comprehend this. It's just mind-blowing, the blessings of the Lord. And so he prays that we be enlightened, that we would have an intimate knowledge of God who has blessed us with these three blessings. The first two, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, uh, introduce. The first blessing that he says is, is the hope of God's calling in my life. It's easy, folks, to be hopeless. It's easy to look at our circumstances uh, and it is easy to look at the world around us and to be hopeless. But you understand a Christian ethic, a Christian teaching is hope. That we are a people of hope. We hope in Christ. On Wednesday night, we men, we studied Acts chapter, or, or I'm sorry, we studied Ephesians chapter 2, and it says that God has raised us to new life with Christ, and that he has seated us in the heavenly realm with Christ, meaning for eternity, we have this place of honor, uh, uh, seated at the family table with Christ. That is a message of hope. And, and, and like the men on Wednesday night said when we studied that, we, we said it to one another. We said, I, I hope that is true. Like that is so 
awesome. That is so amazing. What if that really is true? That, that we have a place of honor at the table of Jesus Christ for eternity. How awesome that would be. We are a people of hope. The first blessing that Paul unpacks is the, the hope of God's calling. As I said, I have to move, move on. So number two, the blessing of God in Christ for the believer. The second one is this, the richness of my inheritance in Christ. We talked about that quite a bit in last week's message. It is tempting to focus all of my energy on current need. It is tempting for you to focus your 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 uh, your energy on poverty, on on your lack, on what you what you need that you don't have. It seems clear, however, from Jesus teaching from Paul's teaching. It seems clear that in heaven in heaven, there are, there, is, there are jobs, and there is wealth, and there is, is fortune, and there are possessions, and there is industry, and that we will be active, and that we, we will be productive, and, and, and there, there is an inheritance laid up for you. You don't have it yet. You have it in, 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 in a small amount, but you don't fully have it. Remember, as we talked last week, you have that deposit. You have that guarantee, but Paul says, here's an astounding blessing in Christ. You have an inheritance in Christ for eternity. We will never run out. There will never be a shortfall. And then the third blessing is the one that we're going to camp out on today. I've already introduced it. And it goes like this. The greatness of God's power has been made available to me as a Christ follower. The, the, the greatness, the immeasurable greatness of God's power power is active and available in your life. You may not see it. You may not feel it. You may be living as though it's not there, as though you have a million dollars in the bank, you, but you just forgot to ever spend it. You, you may not be aware of it, but God's power is alive and available in your life. And here's why I want to spend the rest of our time on this this morning. Because Paul is so desirous that the believer understand God's power in his life, in her life, that he gives us five examples of God's power in the life of Jesus Christ. And what he says is, yeah, uh, example number one, he says, God's power in the life of Jesus Christ. That's the same power in your life. It's not just sort of like it. It's the same power. And then he says, example number two, of God's working in the life of, of Jesus Christ. He says, that's the same power that's in your life. It's not like it. It's not a dulled version of it. It's the same power. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that is alive, available, activated in your life. He said, I really want your eyes to be opened that you might believe this. So here are five reasons. God's power in the life of a believer, it's like five things. It's like five things. God's power in the life of the believer is, number one, like the power that raised Christ from the dead. You see that in verse 20. Again, we're not going to we're not going to bounce back and forth uh, from, from screen to screen. But in verse 20, he says that. That it's like the power that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Like the power that raised Christ from the dead. That is the power that raised you from the dead as well. We've, we've heard Paul say, Oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? It's 1 Corinthians 15. We know that we know that we know that Jesus said, "In me you are no longer condemned." This is John 11. We know that Jesus said, "He who believes in me will never die." That's John 11. We know we know 
But do we know? We know that the power that raised Christ from the dead, that defeated the grave, that is the same power that is available to you, O Christ follower. May we feel that power. See, as, as Paul is, is praying this and he's, he's, he's unpacking it, I too, all I'm doing is I'm unpacking, it's real simple, you could preach this message, I'm just unpacking what Paul is saying, but, but I'm praying over you, I'm praying that, that God would give us eyes to see, that he would activate our vision, that, 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 that we would feel it, that we would, that we would really taste it for the first time maybe. May we feel the power that, that, that raised Christ from the dead. May we own it. May we live it. May we love it. May, it. may it rule in our hearts. May our children see it in our lives. Number two, God's power in the life of the believer is like the power that seated Christ at the Father's right hand. God's destiny for Christ had always been, you will go, my only begotten Son, you will go to the earth, you will interact with humanity, they will know God because you are, will make, them, make God known to humanity, you will, you will die, uh, you, will, you will reanimate yourself, you will come back to life, you will defeat death, and then you will be seated high, you will be lifted up, that all men and women might be drawn to you. That was always God the Father's uh, plan uh, for God the Son. Like the power that, is, that, that seated Christ at the Father's right hand, that is the same power in your life. Why is that so significant, so important for us to believe in? Why is it astoundingly important that we understand that God raised Christ to this, this position of authority, this position of honor. I'm about to tell you something that, that you, you may not even believe. But see, I'm not going to tell you. I'm just going to read it. It's, it's Ephesians chapter 2. So you're compelled to believe this. Look at this. This, is, this isn't the passage we're preaching on today, but it's what, it's what the men studied on Wednesday night. Look at what this says. For he, he God, he, he raised us from the dead along with Christ, but that's not all that he did. It says that, and he seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. Can I just say as your pastor, I don't even fully comprehend what that means. But I know it's something astoundingly good. We didn't just get out of jail free. We didn't just, we didn't just, we didn't just escape hell. Like I would say, like, that's enough, God. Just, if I could just avoid hell. And God says, oh, no, no, no. You, you, your expectations are too low. God says, the power, <laughs> the power that defeated death for Christ is the same power that defeated death for you. And the power that, that ascended, that raised, that raised Jesus to this position of authority, seated him at the table, that same power for you, Christian. If you're a Christ follower, you have a position at the table for eternity. You have been raised with Christ. You, you, you have been seated in the heavenly realms with Christ. Our life is hidden with Christ in God. It is only a matter of time before we cash in on this inheritance. It is only a matter of time before we inherit everything fully. Now we just have the deposit, but one day fully. The same power, evidence number two, Paul says the same power that, that, that is alive and active in your life, it's, it's like the power that raised Christ seated him in the heavenly realms. Number three, God's power in the life of the believer is like the power that exalted him above all demonic authority. That's verse 21. What's it saying? It's saying that God the Father put the devil under the feet 
of Jesus Christ, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but, but also in the ages to come. God has put everything <clears throat> under the feet of Jesus. He started with the devil. We know from the book of Genesis, God already intended the devil will be under the feet, under the rule and the authority of Jesus. Uh, under the feet of Jesus. The, the throngs of demons that war against you 24-7. The, the throngs uh, of demons, Satan's minions that want to take you out, that want to kill your family, that want to divide your marriage. God has put them under the feet of Jesus. They are held at bay by the power and authority of Jesus in your life. As Satan hates you with a, with a white hot hate, you survive only by the immeasurable power of God in your life even when you're going through a sleepy life not realizing the power and authority of Jesus in your life. It's still there. It's still active. It's still alive. It's still keeping Satan at bay. It's still keeping you alive and keeping you safe. Colossians says this. God disarmed the rulers and authorities, put them to shame by triumphing over them in Christ. And so Paul says, like, the power that's in your life, you think it's dull. You think it's not worth talking about. You think it's not worth chasing out after with all the passion that you have. He says, but it is worth chasing after. It is like, Paul says, it is like the power that exalted Jesus above all demonic authority. It's why we pray when you pray. It's, it's, it's like when we pray uh, the Lord's Prayer, and we say what? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And God says, I can do that. God says, I will do that. God says, that's a prayer that you, that you will pray that I will always answer. Objectively, God says, I will always answer that prayer. That is always the will of the Father. When you pray, deliver us from the evil one, God says, yes and amen. Number four, it comes out of verse 22. God's power in the life of the believer is like the power that put all things under his feet. Now notice, we said that, 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 that Satan and his minions, of, of uh, his demonic army, uh, they, they, they are under the feet of Jesus. But now, now Paul goes further and he says, number four, it's like the power that put all things under Christ's feet. Comes out of verse 22. Notice, all things... And listen, if, if you are a hopeless person today, if you are hopeless as you travel internationally or as you travel uh, locally or as you read the news or as you think on the future or as you consider all the wrongs being done against you and all the wrongs that you do to others, notice what this says. It says that all things, all things under the feet of Christ forever. So I have a fairly brief, um, non-exhaustive list of what has been placed under the feet of Christ, under the authority of Christ for eternity. Under the feet of Christ would be all of history. Every human being that's ever walked the face of the earth, all demonic forces, under the feet of Jesus, all biology, all nature, all illness, quantum computers, 
the cure for cancer and space flight and the global economy and people migration, animal migration and weather patterns and, and global warming and fresh drinking water and all the rise of world leaders and all the, 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 the fall of world leaders, just to name a few of the all things under the feet of Christ forever. All things means all things. And Paul says, the power that is active in your life, the immeasurable power of God, Paul says, it is like the power that has put all things under the feet of Christ. And in the last example, as, as Paul compels us to believe that, that God's power is available to us, the last example is when Paul says, and in, in, in God has, or in, in, in God has given, as given Christ as the head to the church, as a gift to you, the church. God, God has, has given Christ to you as, as the head, the authority. But then He also says, and He has given you the church to Christ as his body. God's power in the life of the believer is like the power that made the church his body. Verse 23, we, we have that. It says this. The church, which is his body, whose body Christ's body, we the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now I'm, I'm concerned, or at least, at least pretty convinced, convinced that, that we, average churches like us, average in size or small in size, that, that we feel like, ah, eh, you know, this is, this is fun, this is kind of cool, but it's not it's not amazing. It's not, certainly not supernatural. And then I think when you, when you go to really big churches, I think there's, there's that same sort of like, eh, this is, this, is, this, is, this is cool, you know, it's fun, but it's not supernatural, it's not amazing. This is more like a, a business. And, and what I, I think that we should all embrace and, and realize is, is that the local church, the global church, the rural church, the urban church, the church that meets under a tree in Africa, the, mer the church that meets at Bujak Plaza, the church that meets in stadiums, we are the body of Christ. And, and that, is, that is astoundingly supernatural. In this last phrase, this is the, this is the end the end of chapter 1. The, the last five or six words, it says that, that we, the church, we are, we are uh, the body of Christ. And, and Paul is saying that, that God doing that took, took immense, immeasurable, supernatural power to make us the body of Christ, to bring us together like that. Um, and, and then it says... The body, uh, the fullness of him, Christ, who fills all in all. What is that saying? It's saying Christ fills all in all. Well, other, other, other translations say that, 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 fi that Christ will, will fill every void. That, that, that he will fill every aspect of of the universe, of, 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 of God's creation. That that, that, is, that that is God's intention. That has always been God's intention. That he would, that he would flood all of existence with the, the name and the fame and the glory of Jesus Christ. But, but what I really think this is saying, and, and if this is true, this is just astounding. What I really think he's saying here is, the, 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 the immeasurable power uh, that, that, that he speaks of was necessary to make this happen. To, to make the church 
the body of Christ and then and then in 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 filling all of the existence with Christ what he's really doing is he's using the church the body of Christ to you could perhaps call us the vehicle to to fill all of existence and if that's true and I think that's what he's saying then do you understand the weight of the significance of the power of the calling of the church and that's you that, that's what God has called us to. He said, immeasurable power I bestow upon you. Immeasurable power I grant to you that you might, the body of Christ, that you might fill every void with Christ. That, that, you, might, that you might fill every aspect of the universe with the name and the fame and the glory of Christ. That is, that is the role, the calling, that is what... The, the body of Christ has been empowered to do. It just, it just bolsters, it just supercharges the love that I've always had for the church. The immeasurable power of God in your life. I, I, know, that we, I know that we believe in it, that we have some sort of knowledge. Oh, that it might not be a devil knowledge. And I can't do that. All I can do is preach to you God's word and, and pray earnestly as Paul prays that, that God would, would give us eyes to see. That he would enlighten our hearts that we might, that we might savor, that we might, that we might taste, that we might taste, that we might, we might grab that that handful of popcorn and the first time ever we say ah now for the first time ever I, I taste I, I really experience it now I see what you're talking about and I want can I have a bag of that can I have a lifetime supply of that if you miss if you miss the, the weight of the significance of the power of of Satan in this world, you will never fully grasp the weight of the experience of the immeasurable power of God in your life. What I want for us as, as a family, the Caulfield family, what I want is, is for us to fully realize that, that we're not waging war against one another. Not really. This is Ephesians 6. We'll be talking about this in, in, a, in, a, in a couple of months. But we're not waging war against one another. Uh, you're not my enemy. I'm not your enemy. Your boss is not your enemy. Your, your spouse is not your enemy. Your, your parents, they're not your enemy. I, I think if you know your enemy, you, you realize who your enemy is and, and the power working against you, then perhaps we can see and savor and, and to some degree comprehend the immeasurable power of God in our lives. And so let me pray that for you, for me. Let us pray.